you know, you have to love children because there's something so innocent and honest about children. You know, especially when they're in that age, they're in that like kind of four, five, six age where they don't really realize the implications of everything that they're saying and, and, and what it could mean. And uh, they'll just speak their mind and they'll say things in such a beautiful way that even though if they maybe they shouldn't have said it and when they're older, they might think, I can't believe I said that. When they say it, it's so beautiful. It reminds me, of course, of my son Obadiah, who's uh, never been uh, the kind of kid who was at a loss for words. And uh, we were sitting in my, at my father-in-law's house with, um, you know, and we're all sitting around the table. And uh, Lynn's oldest brother, Paul, we love so much, but, uh, but he's never put his faith and trust in Jesus. And so um, Obadiah decides on this trip that he's going to make sure he talks to Uncle Paul about Jesus. You know, because, you know, when you're, when you're like six years old and you think about the God, you're like, man, people need to know about Jesus. And so sure enough, they're sitting there and we're all eating pancakes and we're talking and everything. And, and then Obadiah's like, well, Uncle Paul, you know, like, so what about Jesus? And Uncle Paul's like, well, you know, like, I'm Jesus. You know, he starts messing with Obadiah. You know, and Obadiah starts giggling. He's like, you're not Jesus. Oh, yes, I am. Oh, no, you're not. Well, you're my Uncle Paul. Well, you're not Jesus. You know, and all of a sudden, Uncle, and Uncle Paul's getting bold. And finally, Obadiah goes, Uncle Paul, you just need to know Jesus, dude. And, and literally my father-in-law practically falls off the chair, hysterically laughing. And my brother-in-law, Paul, who I love so much, who, who, who definitely has the gift of gab, he doesn't even know what to say at that point. Like he's kind of like stuck. You know, and they just change the subject. And, you know, and, and it's a beautiful part of, 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 of being a child is that you're, you're not self-conscious enough to realize that you're not supposed to shine so brightly. You know, and, and, I, and I think in a lot of ways, that's something that as you get older, we have this tendency to like, you know that you're supposed to shine bright for Jesus. You know that because Jesus is the light and God wants to do a work in the world, that, that God is inviting each one of us to be a part of something so much bigger than ourselves. But there's that part of us in our self-consciousness that we say to ourselves, well, I don't know that I want to be that person. And in every moment, we make these decisions if we're going to shine brightly in the world or if we're going to just kind of be like everybody else. And we've been talking about this over the last few weeks here at Crossroads because God shared with us at the beginning of the year that 2016 is our year to shine. Not that it's only this year, but God wants us to shine. But I also realize that where the rubber meets the road, where you live and I live, shining brightly can be kind of a challenging thing. You start asking yourself, well... How or what if people don't like that I'm shining brightly? And, and you have all these things that start going on. And if you've been around um, the church long enough, you find that oftentimes we just struggle to, how do we, how do we live this stuff out in real time? And so I wanted to take a little time out of our time and just kind of explore this. Now, in order to do this, I, I really just felt that I should share with you maybe the most famous passage in the Bible about shining brightly. Because really what I want you and me, and, and not only those of us who are here on the Crossroads campus, but also all of our church that's scattered all over the place, whether it be on our internet campus or Facebook Live, or people who are hearing this message on the radio or on the television or on the internet later, and all the people... Uh, all of the people of God were meant to shine brightly. So in order to do that, I want you to open up in your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5. I'm going to be spe taking specifically verse 16 of Matthew, chapter 5. Now, if you didn't bring a Bible with you to church, don't worry about it, because those books that are on the seats in front of you, those are Bibles. You can grab those things. Pull that thing out. Matthew's Gospel is easy to find, because if you begin, you know, you have the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation. The last third of your Bible Bible is what we commonly call the New Testament. It's about, it's the, it's the testimony of who Jesus is. And the very first book is the Gospel of Matthew. There's these four, they call them Gospels, or the tellings of the good news. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So find Matthew, and chapter 5 is right there. Now, in context, I'm going to focus on verse 16, but I want to read you verses 13 to 16 to get kind of the sense of what Jesus is talking about. So in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, it says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. 
You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. And then verse 16, which is the verse that I want to focus on today. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Now, in verses 13 to 16, Jesus is playing with two different pictures. The idea of being salt and the idea of being light. Now, I want you to notice first that he doesn't say that you might be salt or that you might be light. He says, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. So this isn't like a hopeful statement. This is a statement of reality. And if you're here today and you've put your faith and trust in Jesus, then in Jesus' economy, because of who he is, you are the salt of the earth and you are the light of the world. Okay? So this is who we are as we've been recreated in Jesus. Now, I'm not saying that you're existing as salt and light right now. But that is who you are in Christ. Jesus' perfectly lived life and his death on the cross and his resurrection is actually designed to make you both salt and light. Now, it's beautiful because you think of the idea of salt, right? Salt absolutely is a seasoning, right? It's something that you sprinkle on your food and it gives it a, a little seasoning. Now, also in Jesus' day, this was long before the time of ice boxes and freezers, uh, salt was also used as a preservative. If you had meat, you would rub salt on it. I mean, we do it for, for flavor's sake now. But, you know, you, you rub salt on it, and it would keep the meat longer from decay. And so the idea of us being salt, the idea is that the job of the people of God in Jesus is meant to be a seasoning to make the world a little bit more flavorful. Now, I don't know about you, but when you hear that kind of an idea, you think to yourself, well, is the church really be in seasoning in the world that we live in? Like, are we bringing out all the flavors of what real life is in the world today? Not so much. So it's something we got to work on. But that's what Jesus said that we are. And then the other picture, you have this salt picture. And he says, if you're not, if salt isn't being salty, then it's not worth anything, right? You just throw it out, right? And so the idea is an exhortation for us to be flavorful, and then in verse 14, he begins this light of the world picture. He says that a city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Now, what's amazing is, is if you go to, uh, to Capernaum, where Jesus shared this Sermon on the Mount, even to this day, if you look back behind you, if you're like, if you're, instead of looking at the Sea of Galilee, if you turn away and you look at the mountains behind you, the city of Safad is up on a hilltop. And Safad, that city existed in the time of Jesus. And so the idea was he's talking and he's like, look, you're the light of the world. Then he looks back and he looks at the city of Safad. It's on the, the hilltop. He says, yeah, you see that city? You can't hide that that city's there. No matter what you do, everyone knows that there's a city on that hill because it's on the hill. And the idea is that the people of God is the light of the world. We should be noticeable because you can't miss us because when a city's on a hill, you can't pretend like it's not there. And in the same way, the people of God as light, we should be observable. We should be noticeable by everybody, just like a city on a hill. Verse 15, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. The idea is if you get yourself, I mean, that's like today, right? If you were to build a house, right? They have lights in the ceiling. Why? Because in the ceiling, the light can disperse and, and bring the most light to the room. You don't buy a lamp and stick it in a drawer or in a closet, right? Unless you need a light in the closet. So when you go in, you can turn the light on so you can see what's in the closet. So the idea is that light is meant to be observable for everybody. And then we have our verse 16, which is kind of the culmination of this idea. Now, what I wanted to do for you, because I realized that we hear so much information every day that you end up having an attrition of, of understanding, which means like you hear this stuff and then a couple hours later, you only remember a little bit and a couple hours more later, you only remember a little more, a couple hours more later, you only remember a little bit more. And then by the time a week comes out, you probably don't remember any of it. I put this message into four eyes. There's gonna be four different I statements out of verse 16. And my heart in it is that I want, 
I want you to be able to say, I shine. Right? Like in Jesus, I shine. Go ahead, just tell me. Say, just say, say, Pastor Daniel, I shine. Go ahead. Yeah. Say it again. And say it like you actually mean it, like you really want to shine. Go ahead, say, I shine. That's right. See, this is what we want us to be, people who shine. Because Jesus says, you are the light of the world. So I'm going to jump in. Verse 16, I'm going to focus our time here. It says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Now, I want you to notice these first few words. Let your light so shine. So the first I is that you and I need to illuminate Jesus. That is our job. Our job is to illuminate. Now you might say, illuminate Jesus. I thought, Jesus, how do we do that? Notice it's let your light so shine. See, Jesus places this light that is shining as for each one of us as an individual, it is our light, right? Let your light. So we need to illuminate Jesus. Now, the idea of illuminate, obviously, if you go to a hardware store and you need to buy some bulbs, right? How many of you get confused when you're in the bulb section of a hardware store? I absolutely do. You know what's amazing? I always take the bulb that I need to get replaced and I always bring it there. You know what's amazing? They never have the same one. It's like, like literally, I take pictures of it. It's never the same one. I'm like, what are these lumens? And I'm, I'm asking the person at the hardware store. You know, I, and God bless the people at the hardware store, but they just pretend like they know what they're doing. <laughs> you know, and, and, like, and if you work at a hardware store, God bless you, just pretend on with your bad self. Like, but I, I'm at the point now when I'm in the hardware store, I don't trust anything I hear. Like, oh, this is the best thing ever. You bring it home and it's the worst. This is the right light bulb. It doesn't fit. You know, it's, it's like, this is the way that it goes for me. But what I did learn as I was preparing for this message, I, I actually wondered, what actually is a lumen? Like, wh what is a lumen on a light bulb? You know, it's about, I see, I've seen on a million boxes of light bulbs. I didn't know what it was. You know what it means? It literally means the brightness. The number of lumens, it determines the brightness of a bulb. I was like, wow, okay, so illuminate. The idea is that we are bringing out the brightness of who Jesus is. Now, what is beautiful is Jesus did say in John chapter 8, verse 12, and in John chapter 9, verse 5, he said, he said, I am the light of the world. Right? So Jesus is the one who shines brightly. And then here he says, let your light so shine. And so the idea here is that Jesus is the brightness of the glory of God. That's what the Bible says. That Jesus takes who God is and brings him out into the open. And we're going to talk about that in a second, right? And because Jesus brings God's brightness out into the open, we, as his followers, are meant to do the exact same thing. And we do that by letting our light so shine. Now, you have to realize two things. Notice the idea of let. I think it's important. Because Jesus is saying, I want you to allow yourself to shine in this world. It's, it, it involves us making a decision saying, I want to shine into the world. In some ways, we just saw this video of, of these missions teams that we sent back. And I love not only seeing the videos, but talking to people who've been on these trips and hearing, like, like you get that, they get that look in their eye where all of a sudden, like, they're not the same than when they left. God has done something, and now all of a sudden, they have a new way of looking at their life and a new way of looking at the world. And that gets me excited. Because what they realize, by, by taking the step of faith, by re simply responding to the Lord's encouragement to step on out, now all of a sudden, they've had this experience, and now they're like, well, if I could do it in Browning, Montana, or Antigua, Guatemala, I could do it in Vancouver, Washington. So... My first question is, are you letting yourself illuminate Jesus into the world? Are you allowing yourself to be a reflection of Jesus' light into the world? It is His light that we reflect, but we allow ourselves to reflect that light. You make a decision to say, I'm going to shine brightly into the world. So not only is this, you get to make a decision by letting it happen, but also let your light so shine. You know, and if you ever wonder if Jesus like had some swagger, some style, he wants you to not just shine, he wants you to so shine. And I kind of like that about the Lord. 
Because it's like, there's a little bit of like, yeah, come on. Like, let, let it so shine. You know, and I believe that the Lord doesn't want us just to shine a little bit. He wants you to so shine. And uh, now, now ask yourself, are you not, uh, not only letting yourself reflect the light of Jesus in the world, but are you allowing yourself to what? So shine. That's good, right? You like that. I want you to write that in your notes, right? So shine. If you got your Bible there, I want you to reach over. And I want you to underline the word so in your neighbor's Bible. So shine. Let your light so shine. You know, again, talk about kids. We, we were hiking in Camas. We were going around Round Lake, my, my, my little family. And sure enough, we met some, some folks who were brand new to Crossroads. It was so fun because we were getting to know them. They were sharing life and everything. And all of a sudden, little Maranatha, who's eight years old, talking to, to, to the wife of this family, she's like, well, you know, you should go to women's ministry. Like little Maranatha, she's, and, and like the woman said, oh, yeah, yeah, I really want, no, no, you need, it's Tuesday mornings, 9 o'clock, went Tuesday evening, 7 p.m. Now it starts a week from this Tuesday, but she was just like right out there. She's like, I just wanted to get her to go to women's ministry, because Maranatha's got her so shine all polished. <laughs> but brothers and sisters, listen, we're doing this each one reach one for this service next week, this brand new series. I want you to so shine. I, I, I want you to make your Facebook page so shine. I want you in, 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 in work or when you're moving around, just, you're, so, you're just like, listen, come with me to church on Sunday. Man. Hey, come on. I'm going to men's a week from Tuesday. Hey, we got this new Sunday night service that's starting a week from today at 6 p.m. And you're like, man, I want you to come with me. Come and just, just, just shine and, and, and allow it to flow forth from your life. I think for some of you, there was a time when you were really shining, but you kind of lose it over time. Like if you're not busy shining on, you have a tendency to start to diminish. And one of the things that every single day I say, Lord, will you let me shine brightly? Every, I, I don't want to get sluggish as we talked about last week. I don't want to get lazy. I don't want to start to diminish that shine, but I want to so shine. And I want you to do that because the world needs the people of God to, to shine on. Again, this is why we're having connect and serve this. Like, you have an opportunity to say, I'm going to allow God to use me in ways that I never expected by stepping on out, by serving in kids' ministry or serving in groups' ministry. So we want to illuminate Jesus. You know, this reminds of that popular kids' song, right? This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. See, the problem with the song is, is that we sing the song today with kids, but we divorce it from the reality that Jesus is the light. So in, in our culture, it's used as, well, you just shine your light. But really, Jesus is the light. We reflect the light, but we want to say, Lord, I want this light that I'm responsible for my life. I want it to shine the light of Jesus into the world. So first, let your light so shine. We're going to illuminate Jesus. Now, look at what it says next. In the middle of verse 16, it says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see. You notice that phrase there, before men that they may see? Now we need to incarnate Jesus. We need to incarnate Jesus. They may say, well, hold on. I thought Jesus is the incarnation. That word incarnate, now, I remember when I first heard the word incarnation, I thought it was the instant breakfast. And I'm sure there's some of you right now, you're like, all right, Jesus likes a little instant breakfast. No, no, the word incarnate, it literally means, it's a theological term, which means the, the enfleshment, Jesus taking on flesh. It comes directly out of John chapter 1, verse 14, where it says, and the word, speaking of Jesus, became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. See, Jesus, eternally God, became flesh. He took on flesh. Eugene Peterson, in his paraphrase that we call the message, says, Jesus moved into the neighborhood. Which is such a cool way to say it. He moved into the neighborhood. God came out of glory and moved on into humanity. The same idea. Let your light so shine before men that they may see. See, your job and my job as followers of Jesus is to put real life, flesh and blood, on the reality of who Jesus is. And that is called being incarnational. We are putting 
hands and feet on the work of Jesus in the world. And as a church family, this is something that we are so passionate about. We're so passionate about being the hands and feet of Jesus in our community, in our world. I mean, if you've been around Crossroads even for a little time, you always see we're always doing different projects. Like, like in the springtime, we did this huge project where we were collecting uh, supplies for Vancouver public school system. And as a church family, we got together and collected almost $50,000 worth of things that literally they've been, they have a, a van that they go from school to school when kids are getting dropped off and picked up and parents can come and collect the things that they need for their kids, you know? And we do that because God loves kids, you know? And, 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 and it's amazing, like we did our VBS, right? We had, we had the largest VBS we'd ever have here at Crossroads this summer. We had 900, over 900 kids signed up, right? The kids collected stuffed animals for Clark County foster care. Right? That's what they, and, 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 and as they were bringing all these stuffed animals, all the kids are praying over each one of them. What's amazing is we have a family in our, in our church who about three months later, or two months later, received a kid from uh, Clark County Foster Care. And the only thing that that kid had was a stuffed animal. And this was a woman who was involved in VBS and collecting those. And she's like, to see it come full circle where this child had to be removed from his home, taken from school, and all he had with him was his backpack and a new stuffed animal that he got from Clark County Foster Care. Why do we do that? Because I couldn't imagine being in the situation of that child, but to get, a, to get something in that moment other than all the atrocity is a beautiful thing. We're going to start a new project in just the next coming weeks where we're helping refugee families, a project that we've been doing for a while. Right? But we're taking the next step. We do these things because we want to be the hands and feet of Jesus. See, and not only do we do it as a church, but we want each one of us to live our entire lives saying, how can I put real life, flesh and blood, onto the life-giving message of Jesus? See, it's the demonstration of who the Lord is in our lives. And each one of us has a myriad of opportunities to be the hands and feet of Jesus in your families, in your neighborhoods, within the, the, the spheres of influence you have. And my encouragement and my prayer and my passion is for us as the people of God is that we would grab hold of all of those. That we wouldn't say, this isn't my responsibility, but we'd say, this is an extraordinary opportunity that the Lord has given me to be the hands and feet of Jesus in the world. Because what I have found is the greatest cure for a life that is discontented is self-sacrificial service. The greatest cure for your own struggles and angst of unhappiness, and I don't have everything that I want, is to be able to count your blessings. And you do that by helping other people. Brothers and sisters, one of the greatest ways to be the light into the world is to be the vehicle through which God's blessing touches in another person's life. Listen to Charles Spurgeon. They called him the Prince of Preachers. He, was, uh, he preached in, uh, in England about 100 years ago. He said this, Jesus never contemplated the production of secret Christians. Christians whose virtues were never would never be displayed. Pilgrims who would travel to heaven by night and never be seen by their fellow pilgrims or anyone else. See, this idea, let your light so shine before men that they may see. See, we're supposed to live out loud every single day. And our Christian faith is not just how we check off our religious preferences on a census. Our beliefs are lived out every single day. Like I always like to say, I can tell more about someone's faith by their actions by what they say. Like I'll be honest with you, your Christianity is not by how often you come to church, but it's about how you live your life 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. And for us, we want to live out loud before people that they may say. Now we don't do it so that people see us, and Jesus speaks about this, doesn't he? We don't just want to do good things so people say, oh, what good people they are. Wow, you know. The idea is we don't want them to see us. We want them to see how good our Father in heaven is. And the way that we live, we live so that people would say, wow, there must be something to that Jesus thing. And that is a 
serious responsibility, isn't it? When you start thinking about it. That God, he didn't just redeem your life so you can be with him in heaven. He redeemed your life so that you could help bring heaven on earth right now into this messy world. And each one of us, you have, you have a great opportunity to do that. I, I want you to take those opportunities. I want you to, to not be bashful. I want you just to jump into those opportunities to put the, the reality of who Jesus is in flesh and blood right where we live. Because something powerful happens when we do. So, you know, so you have to illuminate Jesus. We let your, our light so shine. And then we want to incarnate Jesus. We want to be the, the living embodiment of the body of Christ into the world. Right? We're incarnating Jesus. Now, notice again in the middle of verse 16. Your good works. You see that? Let your light so shine before men that they may see what? Your good works. Brothers and sisters, we need to imitate Jesus. You and I need to imitate Jesus. You might say, your good works, how is that imitating Jesus? Simple. Listen to what it says in John chapter 21, verse 25. This is the very last verse of the Gospel of John. It says, and these are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Amen. You hear what he's saying here? That all these things that Jesus did, if you were to write down every good thing that Jesus did, all the world couldn't contain all those good works. See, Jesus, because he is perfect, is good, and he does good. And all that God does is good. Now, I know sometimes when God's doing something, we're like, I don't understand how that's good. And I get that. That's where faith comes in. Where you don't understand the ways of God. You don't understand the purposes of God. But God's ways are the right ways. And it says that once we know as we are known, once we don't see through a glass dimly, but once we see face to face, then no one's going to be able to say God did a bad job. That God wasn't a good God. So God's ways are good. And as you and I, right, as we ref reflect the light of Jesus into the world, as we illuminate Jesus to the world, and as we incarnate the message, because we're doing things out loud in real time, we want to imitate Jesus in the ways that we act. The good works that we do. Now here's the thing. In every situation, you want to ask yourself, what would Jesus do? How would Jesus handle this? Now, I realize Jesus didn't find himself in a lot of the situations that you and I find ourselves in. But what I do know is that at the cross of Jesus Christ, Jesus received the just punishment for all the mistakes that everybody has made. So even though Jesus maybe isn't intimately acquainted with what it's like to be married to your spouse or what it's like for this situation or that situation... Right? But what I do know is that at the cross, he became intimately acquainted with all the brokenness of humanity, which means he knows exactly how you feel. He knows exactly how you feel. And so the reality is, is that in the places that you find yourself, we should always not be responding to someone else's bad way of acting, but we should be saying, Lord, I want to respond to you, and I want to be light in the midst of the world by working in such a way that is good. By not rendering to people evil for evil, but good for evil. I don't want to give people cursings for cursing. I want to give them blessings for cursings. Why? Because that's exactly who Jesus was. Now right here, right now, I know what happens. Each one of us, we have all these things that have gone on where you're like, well, yeah, that's fine, but not there. And here's what I want to tell you. When Jesus was hanging on the cross, he prayed a prayer, didn't he? He said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they're doing. I mean, these are the very people who were brutalizing him. And Jesus was able to pray for forgiveness for them while he was yet in the process of losing his life. And if Jesus can do that, then Jesus can give you the grace to forgive the people who've hurt you the most. And I know you're saying it's not possible, and I'm saying you're right. With men, it's impossible, but with the Lord, all things are possible. And that is Forgiveness is a good work that God bought in Jesus' own blood on the cross. So is, are you imitating Jesus into the world? 
Are, are you watching the way, the rhythms of who the Son of God is and watching how He moves through life and saying, I want to be just like that in my situations? I mean, even you think about the way Jesus dealt with Judas Iscariot. When Jesus picked Judas, He knew that Judas was going to betray Him. But nobody knew that Judas was the one. On the Last Supper, Jesus says, one of you is going to betray me. I was like, is it me, Lord? I mean, now, can you imagine if you knew that one of your crew, one of your peeps, one of your posse, you know, one, one, one of your, the folks that you hang with, if you knew one of them was going to do you dirty to death, right? And you knew it the whole time, wouldn't you treat them a little different? It's like you have, like, you know, you're taking them out for dinner, but you're leaving that person out. Right? The real intimate stuff in your life, you know, you, you got a group, you got a group text message, but that person's not on there. Nobody, Jesus didn't treat Judas any different than he treated any of the other guys. He loved them, it says in John's Gospel that he loved them even to the end. You know, and it's even like when, when they came to, when, when Judas came to give him that kiss to show the, the Roman soldiers who Jesus was, even, it's like he's, call, he's like, call, are, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? See, Jesus was able to love Judas even though Judas was going to betray him. Even though Jesus, in his own words, said that Judas was the son of perdition, the son of destruction. See, God wants us to be so different. And the only way that you and I are different is for us to, to, to push away responding to people with the way that they treat us. But, but we respond to the Spirit of God who is within us, who says, listen, there's a more excellent way than the way that you want to live on your own. And I want you to respond to those prompts and be different. And when we do that, now all of a sudden we begin to imitate Jesus. We begin to act differently. We have a different set of ways we go about things. Why? Because of Jesus. Because we see who Jesus is and we live and move differently because of it. Of course, in Ephesians 2.10, it says, and you guys know I love this verse, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God prepared beforehand that we would walk in. Think about that. That God created you uniquely to do certain good works that even before God even knit you together in your mother's womb, He knew that you were going to be the person to do that. And that's all of us. So brothers and sisters, listen, imitate Jesus. I wrote that for each one of you, you have different passions, different things that you care about, different things that when you start thinking about it, it gets you really, really excited, Right? And those are the areas that you should explore first in regards to the good works that God has called you to. See, what happens in the church is everyone gets a little, well, you like this thing, and you like this thing. Well, my thing's better than your thing. Your thing's better than my thing. And none of that's in the Bible. That's, that's, that's competition. See, the Lord isn't saying the nose and the eye are in competition for the most beautiful part of the human face. You know? It's like they're both necessary. And so you need to say, Lord, I want to imitate Jesus. You know how you made me, God. You know what you have for my life. And Lord, I want to just step into that. And I want to respond to you because if we all do that, think about all the, the Jesus imitation that goes on in the world. Because the, for Peter and John, the early apostles, the people in the Sanhedrin knew that they were uneducated, but they knew that they had been with Jesus. Because there was a different quality to who they are. And the Lord wants to do the same thing in us. Now, so we've seen, right? We want to illuminate Jesus because we're going to let our light so shine, right? We want to incarnate Jesus before men that they'd see. We're bringing Jesus, we're bringing him public. We're, we're going out in real time and letting him know, right? And we're going to imitate Jesus because this thing that we're doing before men is good works. No, it's not bad works. It's not evil works. It's not you know, kind of maybe it's good, maybe it's not so good. They're good in God's economy. And we have one more eye. So I'm going to invite the worship team to come on out as I close this out. But look at what it says in verse 16. And glorify your Father in heaven. Brothers and sisters, we need to initiate glory. We need to initiate glory. See, this is important because we're going to let our light so shine, right? So we're going to illuminate Jesus. Our light is going to shine as we're reflecting the light of Jesus, right? 
and we're going to incarnate the message. We're going to do that before people, because they're going to see, and what are they going to see? They're going to see our good works, because we're imitating Jesus, because Jesus was the one who was so full of good works. And when this happens, and glorify your Father in heaven. See, what the Lord is interested in is that because of who we are, and because we are in Christ, and because we are imitating Jesus, now all of a sudden the people who are on the receiving end of the witness of the of crossroads and the people of God, because of who Jesus is, now they begin to give God glory. So the thing that we're doing is we are seeking to initiate other people stepping on into the glory of God. Now that word glory, that's a biblical idea. It speaks of the weightiness of something. It's like the idea like, man, the Lord is so heavy. That's, that's the idea of it. Like, and I don't mean heavy in like he gets on the scale and he tips the scale. I mean like, like, like kind of in like the, man, it's so heavy. When you see something, you're like, wow. And we want our job being recreated in Christ is to see people be able to begin to give God the glory that he's infinitely worthy of. And so it is, speaks about our witness into the world being transformational. And isn't it, like we talk about this all the time here, right? Like, like our mission and vision, that because Jesus is real, we're a family of faith, fully engaged doing what? transforming our community and our world. Why? Because as we do all these things, now all of a sudden people start to say to themselves, man, the God that they serve, he should be worshipped. And they begin to worship. And think about your own life. My guess is that you came to know Jesus because you saw and experienced the witness of somebody else who walked with Jesus. And you thought to yourself, that's really beautiful. Right? Isn't it the truth? Like you, and, and, and the ways that you grow, the ways that you grow is you're around people who are really walking with Jesus and you think to yourself, I kind of want to be like them. Like they're not perfect, but there's something about who they are that is so beautiful that I, I want to be like that. And this is what it's talking about. Because all of a sudden, as you and I illuminate Jesus into the world, right, and we put flesh and blood onto the dynamics of what it means to be in Christ, and then all of a sudden as you're doing these good works because Jesus was so full of good works, all the world couldn't contain it, all of a sudden then people who are receiving it say, I want to be like that. And you realize that it comes from God getting glory. You know what my life verse is? 1 Corinthians 10.31. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, what? Do all to the glory of God. It says, no matter what you do, do it as a witness because the Lord is glorious. And, and, and the idea is whether you choose to eat or drink because in that section of 1 Corinthians, should we eat meat, should we not eat meat, should we drink, should we not? It's like, listen, whether, whatever you do, whether you do or you don't, live to the glory of God. And for us as a, as a family of faith, for the Crossroads family, this is what each one reach one is about. This is what all these service projects are about. This is why we gather together in groups and men's and women's and young's. We do all this because we want to see all this happening. Why? Because we want to see the glory that God deserves from a creation that He sustains and created. We want to see people who are lost be found again. We want to see people who have lost the reality that they exist for God's glory. We want to see them return to that. And with all that God is doing here in Crossroads, we believe that God wants us to be more committed to this than ever. That you and I would be able to say, look, they're worshiping the Lord right now. And you can say to yourself, I got to play a small bit part in that. So brothers and sisters, listen. God wants you to allow Him to reach people through your life. That's, it's a, it's a, that's a simple reality. He wants you to allow Him to touch people's lives through you. And what happens is when God touches someone's life through you, then they begin to, glory gets initiated in their life. Where they begin to praise God. That's what I like to say, what transforms people, transform people. And it's not us, it's the Lord, but we allow this thing. We become part of it. So brothers and sisters, listen. Next week we start this new series. Grab a stack of those cards. 
give them out. Allow the Lord to touch people through your life. Sign up for kids. Sign up for groups. As men's and women's and recovery and young adults start back up again, engage yourself there and allow the Lord to touch other people through your life. And listen, if you're here today and you've never said yes to Jesus, you've never put your faith and trust in Him, I believe that the reason you're here today is for that reason. Because you know, in, when, when you pull back all the layers of life, you know that God is real. You know that Jesus is real. And you know that you didn't just happen by a random collection of, of, of happenings and, you know, and, and, and you're here today. You know that you've been created fearfully, uh, extraordinarily. And you know that God has a plan for your life. And I'm here to tell you, until you say yes to Jesus, until you put your faith and trust in Him, you will never understand who you truly are until you see yourself as God truly created you to be. And I believe that you're here today because you know that and God is inviting you to say, listen, before you can be a vehicle through whom to touch other people, let me touch you. Let me do a work in you. And God wants to transform you from the inside out. Now, I know some of you are saying, you're saying, no, no, listen, but you don't know where I've been. Like, I, you know, there's stuff going on, and i got this history. Listen, God accepts you just the way that you are. He, he knows who you are. He accepts you just the way that you are, and He also loves you too much to leave you there. And I love that. Because God, He accepted me in all of my mess, and I'm so grateful. Not only does He love me too much to keep me there, He's still working on me today. He's changing me. He's changing me just as much today as on the day that I put my faith and trust in Jesus. He's doing a work in me. And God created us to be people who God can do work in. But you have to say yes to Jesus. You have to allow Him to forgive you of your sins. You have to allow Jesus to place His Spirit in your heart. And that only happens by putting your faith and trust in Jesus. Will you say, I'm going to allow you to take up residency in my life. Not working on me from the outside, but working on me from the inside. And in a moment, I'm going to give you an opportunity to make that decision. And I'm here to tell you, if you say yes to Jesus, what I can tell you is that the experiences that you will have in God will be so extraordinary. You'll, you'll be like, I can't even, I can't believe this is real. But in your heart, you'll know that it is because Jesus is real. So let's bow our heads and our hearts as we pray together. Father, 